this morning's message is entitled, New Math. And you might wonder what that has to do with coming to worship and talking about God and Jesus. But if you'll be patient with me, I think you'll understand where I'm going. Uh, the text of the message is taken from Matthew chapter 20, verses 13 through 16. It's just a snippet of a parable that Jesus is telling his followers. But this is the important part for me in terms of tying this into the message this morning. Matthew chapter 20, verses 13 through 16. He replied to the one speaking for the rest, Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I'm generous? Here it is again, the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last, and the last first. I know that I'm speaking to a group of people that for the most part can remember new math. Do you remember that? Remember when new math came into vogue, it was first introduced in our schools like back in the 60s? You know, it was launched just after Sputnik, and in order to maybe boost our science and math skills here in the United States so that we could face the intellectual threat of Soviet engineers designing Sputnik, because reportedly they were very skilled mathematicians, we did that so that those demands could be met. It was basically an experimental form of arithmetic, and at least... For my part, it was extremely confusing. According to new math, adding, subtracting, and multiplying just simply didn't work the old way, the way that we learned it, the times tables and your addition tables. Things didn't add up according to new math. So they came up with this new math, which involves something called base theory. For instance, in base 10, which is the base that we use, 2 plus 2 equals 4. But in new math, using base 3, for instance, 2 plus 2 equals 11. Now, I can't really tell you why 2 plus 2 equals 11 in base 3, because I'm not exactly sure that I really understand it myself. But you can see how it could be very confusing. Since if you change the context or you change the base, then all of a sudden numbers have entirely new meanings. And I think there is a sense in which sometimes our Christian faith, especially to those outside, sounds an awful lot like new math. There are times when what God does <laughs> just doesn't really seem to add up. For example, there's Jesus' parable of the shepherd who left the 99 sheep and headed out into the darkness to search for one lost lamb. Do you remember that story? It's a noble deed, absolutely. But I want you to think about the underlying math supporting that parable. Jesus says that the shepherd left the 99 sheep, quote, in the country which presumably means they were vulnerable to rustlers, they were vulnerable to wolves, or maybe they just had a general idea of bolting for freedom. But how would that shepherd have felt if he'd returned with the one lost lamb across his shoulders only to find 23 others are now missing? I mean, it doesn't make mathematical sense. And then there's the scene in John's Gospel where a woman whose name was Mary takes a pint of exotic, expensive perfume. It was worth an entire year's wage. And she pours it all over Jesus' feet. Now let me ask you, have you ever owned a bottle of perfume that cost $51,000? $916.27. I didn't pick that number out of the blue. I actually did a little research, and that was the average year's wage. Have any of you ever owned a $50,000 bottle of perfume? 
I haven't. Even Judas <laughs> noticed that the math in this situation didn't add up. I mean, surely Mary could have put just a little, maybe an ounce, on Jesus' feet and then sold the rest to feed the poor. Arguably, I think, if it was really good perfume, Jesus would have smelled just as good. So why overdo it? Why waste an entire jar, especially on Jesus' nasty feet, when an ounce, maybe on the pulse points, would do? Apparently, Mary flunked math. Since, in our way of thinking, her calculations were way off. Mark's gospel contains a third example of new math. After watching a widow drop two little coins into the temple collection plate, Jesus compares it to the larger financial gifts that are being made by the more wealthy worshipers. He said in Mark chapter 14, verse 23, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And you're thinking, what kind of rocket scientist did Jesus confer with to come up with that conclusion? How could two pennies equal more than fistfuls of brand new $100 bills? Now the parable in Matthew chapter 20 is about a farmer. And I would encourage you today, go back home and read the entire chapter so you understand the context, but I'll try and at least summarize it for you. Matthew chapter 20 is a parable, and it's about a farmer who at sunrise goes into town and hires day laborers to help him pick grapes in his vineyard. Now, temperatures in Palestine during the harvest season in particular frequently exceed 100 degrees. So it's really hot, dusty work. And grape harvests by themselves are very hectic, and they're very demanding since there's a very narrow window of opportunity to harvest the grapes. And in fact, even now, for instance, you know, most of you know that I live in Ramona. Ramona in that valley has now been designated a viticultural district. It's kind of like the Napa Valley. Well, now we have the Ramona Valley wines. And I know a few people who have vineyards there, and they are constantly testing the sugar content of the grape. It's called bricks, B-R-I-X. And they're constantly testing it. And when the grape reaches just the right level of sugar content, that's when you make the harvest. And you can't let them remain on the vine for very long, otherwise the sugar content begins to go away, the grapes begin to change their flavor and their chemical composition, and they might be fine for table grapes, but maybe they don't make very good wine. So when you want to harvest grapes, you want to do it quickly, you want to do it efficiently, and you want to do it as hurriedly as you can. And then in addition to that, in Palestine, not only are you taking a look at the grape for its bricks, but you also have concerns now about the change of season and the rains coming in. And if the window closes, the crop is basically not worth picking. So maybe in this farmer's haste to get the job done as quickly as he could, he goes into town at 6 o'clock in the morning and hires workers. He does the same thing again at 9 o'clock and hires more workers. He does it again at noon. He does it again at 3. And he does it one last time at 5 o'clock in the evening. So we have 6, 9, noon, 3, and 5. He has gone into town five separate times to hire five separate groups of laborers to help him pick the harvest. At six, the farmer tells his foreman to call it quits for the day and give everyone their pay, starting with those who were hired last. Now, that order probably got their attention because typically when you're paying people, you pay them on a, what they call, FIFO basis, first in, first out. The people who come in first and work first get paid first. 
as opposed to the LIFO function, which is last in, first out. So, and then there's the uh, list, which is, I think it's called last in, still here, or something like that. But anyways, the farmer is now doing things differently. It's a new math. He is paying the first workers last and the last workers first. So the workers are probably looking pretty closely at the paymaster begin to handing out paychecks. So as the owner had instructed, the guys who had worked only an hour, they had only been there since 5 o'clock, they were paid a denarius in the parable. And that's a day's wage. And in California, less taxes, that would be $104. That was a great wage for a day laborer back then. In fact, it was the same wage that was paid to a Roman soldier, which was a whole lot more than just a common day laborer could ever expect to get for even an entire day's work. So at this point, the math certainly does not add up. But the other laborers probably didn't mind, at least not yet, because they're likely very amazed at the farmer's generosity, especially the guys who'd been working since sunrise. They've been out there now for 12 hours. They probably ran the numbers and thought, holy smokes, if these guys who only worked an hour got an entire day's wage, imagine how much I'm going to take home. I mean, I'm going to make a bundle here. But when they got to the paymaster, they got the same amount. And now, they're pretty steamed. Because how is that fair? It doesn't add up. After all, they'd been sweating and slaving at a very high speed under the hot sun all day for 12 hours hours. According to the normal math, each of them should have received $1,450 when you throw in time and a half for four hours overtime. That's what they're thinking. But here, the boss's actions contradicted everything known about employee motivation and fair compensation. I mean, it was atrocious economics. Just plain and simple, it seems unfair. So then what's the point with these atrocious payroll calculations? What is Jesus teaching us in this parable about a seemingly mathematically challenged landowner? To answer that question, we've got to realize that if we try to understand Jesus' story on the basis of math, will miss the point entirely. Because Jesus' parable isn't supposed to make economic sense. It isn't supposed to add up. The point of the parable is about grace. And grace cannot be calculated like a day's wage. Grace is not about finishing last, Grace is not about finishing first. Grace is not about counting at all. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. If God did count our sins against us, if he did pay us, according to what our sins have earned us, we would be in very deep trouble. Here's some more math excerpts from Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and then skipping to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the Wages of sin is what? Death. Praise God that he dispenses gifts to us and not wages. And here's another 
mathematical excerpt from the book of Romans. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Because of his great and truly amazing grace, people who respond to the gospel do not get paid according to their merit. So using our new math as an example, God's base, you know, we talked about base 10 versus base 3 with the new math. God's base is grace. His actions are prompted not by math. His actions are prompted by his great, all-encompassing, unconditional love for us. This love, this grace, is the key to understanding the atrocious mathematics of the gospel. And we have a hard time understanding that. I mean, we often have trouble comprehending God's grace because we're still programmed to think according to our traditional math upbringing. Grace baffles us because it goes against our mental calculations that insist that some price must be paid for our sin. But if you struggle with the mathematics of the gospel, remember that a price was paid. Romans 3, 24 says, We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It has been paid, church. In other words, God gave up his own son rather than give up on humanity. Jesus paid the debt. I don't know if any of you have seen this particular movie. It's called The Last Emperor. And The Last Emperor is about a young child who's been anointed as the last emperor of China. And this child lives a magical life of luxury with a thousand servants at his command. And there is a scene in which his brother asks this very young emperor, what happens when you do wrong? And the boy emperor replies, when I do wrong, someone else is punished. And to demonstrate his point, he picks up a mean base jar and drops it. It breaks into a million pieces. And to pay for that sin, one of his servants is beaten. Jesus reversed that ancient pattern. When the servants erred, the king was punished. Jesus was beaten. He was tortured. He was crucified. He was the payment for our sins. You know, I never really liked math all that much growing up. And in fact, I I actually struggled with math so much that my parents became a little concerned about their only son and only child struggling with math, heaven forbid, the early 60s, can't have that. So my parents invested in some sort of contraption. I can't really tell you what it was because it was pretty early in my life, but it was some sort of contraption that they had been told would help their son with math. And it did. It helped me with just plain, simple math. And I can't tell you exactly when I eventually got math, but by college and graduate school, I was doing calculus. That's a little bit more than just simple math. And at one time in my life, math just didn't make any sense at all. And then, with some help, math made all the sense in the world. And once, I didn't get Jesus either. 
But with the aid of his word, I got him. Not got Jesus in the sense of completely understanding him. (laughs) That's a journey. That's a destination. It's not a point at which I've arrived. But I got Jesus from the standpoint of understanding his grace, which is a place where, thankfully, the math doesn't have to add up. So this week, as you go about your lives, read the parables, read God's word, and see how sometimes he acts in ways that are very unusual, that don't add up. And yet, in God's grand scheme of things, he is trying to make a point for the children that he loves. Why would a woman break a $50,000 bottle of perfume and spread it all over Jesus' feet and then wipe his feet because she's been crying with her hair? Such a waste. But Jesus said, let her do that. Because she was providing a gift to Jesus. The math didn't add up, but she really didn't care. Her heart was in service to her master, to her savior. Jesus did something in Mary's life that changed her. And she could not do enough for Jesus. And I will tell you that in my own personal wanderings, which I've described for you on a number of occasions, I grew up feeling like I had to go to church, I had to serve. And being somewhat service-minded, I did. But it burned me out. And at some point in time, I checked out. And it wasn't until I learned that I don't have to serve God, but I want to. And that made all the difference in the world. You can add up the have to but it's really difficult to calculate the want to. But once you get that, and once you want to serve, then sometimes things don't make sense, but you do it out of a heart of service, and out of a heart of worship, and out of a heart of love and giving. And that's where Jesus wants to come along. So in this fancy mathematical calculation that you see on the overhead, c to the fifth power times three divided by two, equals grace. It's the new math. And in that context, it makes all the sense 